Hey, what's up, Troublemakers? Rod from RKBC here again. I'm finishing up the edit on another uh, Ron Wasserman video. So what you're about to see is the mostly unedited extended interview with Ron Wasserman about the song Go Go Power Rangers. If you haven't seen our main video yet, I encourage you to go watch that first and then come back to this one. But if you already saw that one, you want to see everything that he said, have fun watching this one. We had a great time with Ron. Also, we did a 2020 interview with him on our podcast, Yellow Spandex, and that'll be at the end of this interview and then the link in the description. We'd like to take a moment to thank all the Patreon patrons on screen right now, especially Cal Harrington, Ray Price, Mike O'Brien of Bands Life and Nerds. If you'd like to learn how to support us on Patreon, check out the link in the description below at the end card at the end of the video. Anyway, uh, enjoy the full extended interview with Ron. Yeah, we did other bad stuff too. I remember I would go in the rooms and like cover the room, oh, just open a fire extinguisher and just shoot it into the room. <laughs> People I didn't like. <laughs> don't ever do that. It is a horrible mess. <laughs> There was a lot of... Let's try this side, actually. You do a lot of things I think about doing, but don't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, I do regret doing those things. I mean, luckily, you know, there was never any fights or screaming. It was all this passive-aggressive, childish, <laughs> terrible behavior. Could you hand me that now? I'm afraid to move. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I, I was going to get it. Can you rub my foot? <laughs> I already said that, but we should throw this here if you want to keep that close. You know, I'll, I'll um, hide it down here. So. Okay. All right, scene four, take one. And then, did you want to press the boom? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> My name's any of those videos I watch online where a girl lays under the table. <laughs> I know somebody's seen it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to introduce myself again. My name's Ron Wasserman. I write music for a living. I started when I was a kid, and I've done it ever since. And if you go watch the X-Men video, you'll get a much better introduction than this. But that's who I am. <laughs> Fantastic. So, I mean, a very similar questions to before. I mean, the, the big one being, how did you get involved with the, with the Power Rangers? So I had, um, I was... <laughs> Somebody's stealing my Prius. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds open. It should be yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was playing a lot of bands in the 80s. And it was doing pretty good. And at one point, it was going to be really good. I was a music director for this gal, E.G. Daly. It was a great band. It was Matt Sorum. We went on to play with Guns N' Roses. And, um, and the project was taking off. And it didn't, in short, it didn't go anywhere. So um, I had been living off credit cards and gone through some pretty rough times. So in 89, a friend of mine called me and he said, our engineer can't come in to record one of the composers. So I went in to Saban when it was on Ventura Boulevard in Studio City. And for the first seven hours, um, this guy and I hung out. He just got, he just smoked dope for seven hours. And he goes, all right, ready to record. Pulls out a trumpet pulls out a Lynn drum machine, comes up with a beat, and in one hour records three one-minute cues with alternate endings. So a short ending, a long ending. And he got 150 bucks each for this, so he made 450 bucks. I hadn't made 450 bucks in a week, ever. No, there was one week. There was one really good week. But um, I said, I gotta get into this business. So I was allowed to go in the building unpaid and just mess around in the studio and learn more about how their system worked. And then they brought me in part-time, then they brought me in full-time. And the first three years I just kept writing stuff and there was a couple producers there that were really fundamental to my career change. They broke me of the songwriting format. And then they would come to me with home video stuff and they'd say, uh, can you write a theme for this for the three little pigs? 
And I remember I was writing this stuff like this guy named Danny Kay in these old movies from the 40s and 50s, and he could speak so fast. So I would go, and he puffy, 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 puff, blew those houses down. I was just doing stuff really fast and much better than that. And I would just get a note back, like, what the fuck? We want, you know, something like the three little pigs, there's three little pigs, three little pigs, and a woof, woof, three, you know. So they didn't like what I was doing. Um, but then one night in 92, I went in to the studio and I wanted to work on a song called Breakable, which did really well with uh, my wife and I of the band Fisher. And they came in and they said, we need a song, a theme song for the show called Power Rangers. And the only instruction was, and I cannot remember if there was any footage, um, but the only instruction was maybe use the word go. Himes had a lot of work because he had go gadget, go inspector gadget. So maybe use that. And I remember at one point I had to call my friend and go morphine, morphine or morphine. Are they called morphine rangers? He goes, it's morphine. You fucking moron. <laughs> so, um, I just, uh, I wanted to get it done as fast as possible because I'd had such a, a great long list of rejected themes. So I just went, I'm just going to blow this thing out. And as I was writing, I remember going, oh, this is, I like this, but it's real simple. And in two and a half hours from write it to my guide vocal, it was done. And the next day they called and they said, Fox loves it. And I said, who's going to sing it? And they said, no, it, it, Fox loves it. You're the singer. And I went, no shit. All right. <laughs> and, and um, you know, in today's world, that would mean like, oh, great. Now there's going to be extra SAG fees as the singer. But this was all non-union buyouts back then. So, um, and that's okay. As I've said in many interviews, I got paid to learn how to get into the business. So it was great. And from that moment on, the show caught on fire, and um, I did everything from them until um, I left in the end of 95, but I still did stuff for them afterwards. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I went yeah, off yeah, there, I sorry. Like four or five questions that we had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, for sure. Oh, that was epic. I know you're super into the Power Rangers stuff. Yeah, actually, yeah, they're not, not musical really. <laughs> thinking through stuff. Yeah, you listen to my high harmony on that original, That's you're gonna insane. be like, I'm crazy flat <laughs> but there was it, no auto tune at this point either. no and and it wasn't a matter that i couldn't hit it it's like yeah, yeah just pull a fader down a bit exactly. it's fine it's a guide vocal anyways it's okay somebody else is going to sing it. yeah exactly did you ever do the trick where you like did doubles that were all slightly like apart so it sound less like out of tune each like every the lead vocals are always three takes mm -hmm. The backgrounds, each harmony is three takes. I mean, it is just a fuck ton of vocals. Wow. And I would just gargle. I would always put in Diet Pepsi with ice, get it super cold, and gargle it just to tighten my chords. Right. And I was saying, when I did all those songs, I sang for so long and so hard that my vision would go blurry because my sinuses were swelling up because I sing completely through my throat. Yeah, it's a very growly. Yeah, it's all, it's all in there. And it takes like a minute to get that voice going. A minute no one will ever see. <laughs> I just remembered. So in 2011, I believe, you released Power Rangers Redux. Yeah. And the, the pitch for that was how Ron Wasserman wanted to have them done without the tightness of the schedule. Yeah. What, was there anything, well, I'm sure there was, but like, what were things that you did there that you wish were in the original ones? Um, well, uh, you know what? That's really hard to say because I was just trying to copy the originals. Um. It was all done for fun. I had some free time and I said, I'm going to see if I can still sing the first verse of the theme. So I just worked it up and I layered the vocals and I went, I think I can still do it. And then it turned out I could. And I used, um, like on those high harmonies, very minimal pitch correction. And it was something called Melodyne because I didn't want to get away from anything. 
Um, yeah, the luxury of time. Plus, you already know the songs have done well. I mean, that really, uh, that helps a lot, too. But it was very weird to recut my stuff that I'm allowed to recut, that I have writers on some, but not on most. But I'm not restricted from re-releasing them. It'd be like a band going back, be like Van Halen going back, or the Stones, and recutting verbatim one of their old albums. They, they'd never be allowed to do it. Yeah. So I just had this nice big loophole that allowed me to do it. So it kind of is a testament to your intuition. It's like under a time crunch, you did the right thing. Yeah. And it was fun to do it. I spent, I think, two months recutting those. Because I was also scoring shows at the same time. That's a lot of songs. Yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> and it was hard to go back and listen because none of the original masters, I never had them. And they're all long gone. So I couldn't go back. So I'd have to go back and go, what, what, what is that? Did I, what kick? Is there a kick there? Because I really want it to be as close as possible. What's the, uh, the reaction? Because you said you didn't see footage of it before you recorded the song. Mm -hmm. What was it when you finally saw what the end product was? What, what were your thoughts? I thought this, this, is, this is all so campy and ridiculous that who knows? Because as you know, you never know. Yeah. So I just went. And, and then I had no idea. Because they originally aired it at 8.30 in the morning, The Kiss of Death. And then there was an unbelievably high amount of tardy kids. So Fox went, we're on to something here. So they moved it earlier and then it really exploded. But I was, they were pretty quiet to me. The first time I knew something was happening is we lived in the Hollywood Hills and across was Universal Studios and they had the Universal Amphitheater. And there was a Power Rangers, they were gonna be there. And the freeway backed up for five miles. So my wife and I kind of went down to In-N-Out Burger or something, parked there and walked up. And, <coughs> excuse me, I was given a seat, my wife and I, like far right, 30 rows back. Because that's the way you treat the guy. It's the way I was treated. Just, they probably like put him where nobody will see him and he can't say anything. And I remember they played that thing and the whole place lit up and they were all singing and I went, this is weird. <laughs> very, very weird. And it's really weird that we're sitting way back and over here <laughs> and watching this. She's like, yeah. Well, it, was, it was, that's when I knew. And then the show got bigger and bigger and I was, uh, if any, I worked at nights, but if there was ever a chance of any network exec being around, they got me out of the building. They didn't want anybody to know I was doing this. That's why I didn't do the first film. Because Robert Kraft over at 20th Century said, um, we don't take his name, no, his name appears as composer, so that they yanked me. Did you Which has crossed my line, one of the final songs. That's what that's about. Were you at the premiere or any screenings of the recent remake? No, I haven't even seen it. Oh, really? So just this made, this I was going to wait, and yeah. if everybody went, it's great, I would have go, I would have gone to see it. It was, it was fine, uh, but I was, just from uh, our experience, we went and saw it, I forget where, maybe Universal City or something, mm -hmm. but th the whole thing is done kind of like modern-like, and then when the Megazord comes together, they like do the classic like Power Rangers theme song, and mm -hmm. our screening like almost stood up. Like everyone was like applaud. We couldn't hear over the oh, yeah thing. It was just like a theater rock. It was just like an emotional response. I got teary eyed <laughs> during it. <laughs> well, the um, apparently there were a lot of meetings where they did. The staff was pushing to get me in on it, but and I honestly don't know what it is. But they said. There's some problem there with Haim Saban himself. It's bad blood, I would say. The, so the only thing I can think of after all these years, honestly, is that he and Shuki own the rights. Everybody else knows I did it. He's one of the richest men in the world and called a media mogul, which is fine. It's got to just drive him fucking batshit that the biggest thing that he ever created, he didn't create. Down to its Japanese footage. Yeah. 
So I think all of that just pissed, must just grind away at him. So he should have given me my writer's share and then he'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I think of because we never fought. Even when I said I quit, it was go, have fun. I still did work for him afterwards. Um, I don't know how much you'd be able to talk about it, but like we have other friends that have worked with Saban on things, and mm -hmm. he's notorious for having very like tight NDA security. Like, did you ever experience any of that? Or? I had um, back then. There was a one-page agreement that was written by a nine-year-old. It was it was virtually worthless. So. His lawyers were not watching out for him then. But you feel like he's still trying to like hide you from public consciousness? Well, now it's out of control. It yeah, can't. Yeah. It's, that's why I think it drives him nuts. But early on. Especially with this shattered grid thing. I mean, because I've had a show for years at Nick and did other work at Nick. And I would say, so Power Rangers, like, oh, yeah, you did the original. Must be nice when people watched it. I'm like, mm. so Shattered Grid comes out, it's like a minute 50, and gets seven or nine million views in a week. So that's another, oh, and Wasserman's involved with it. Oh, everything Wasserman does. Even though, you know, it doesn't really make a difference, but it is nice to go like, neener, neener. <laughs> because had I been called for the film, I already had my pitch. I'm like, so here's how we're going to do it. We're going to open up after your film stuff. We're going to just hit up the biggest fucking guitar chord you ever heard. And up's going to come that lightning bolt. And it's going to come up. And then we're going to break into that theme. And no matter what happens in the film, you got them at that point. It is just going to be massive. And we're not even going to do the whole thing. We're just going to like tease. We'll do like the one minute version. I, I, I will agree with that as a millennial. <laughs> that, that would have sold me. Right. Because it took until the Megazord came together and the theme came on for me to be like, this is okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, and, and, you know, that composer, like all, uh, anybody in the business, they're giving him notes and telling him what to do and at a certain point he's going to go, like, find him your fingers, whatever you want. It's the way it ends up sometimes. I've had that on, on a couple television shows. I'm like, just, this chord, fine. Whatever you want. Just please shoot me. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I know that, I mean, obviously you've done a ton of stuff, but because we're focusing on Power Rangers yeah. and uh, X-Men, people, a lot of people were wondering which one was the, is the one, is the final product that you like more or had more fun creating? Well, Power Rangers, because A, I can remember doing the whole thing. I was alone and there were no notes. Um, and because as soon as the show hit and then a friend went, Hey, there's a message board at AOL and you should sign up. So I ran out and bought my 56 or maybe a 28 K modem and dialed up and I started chatting with people. X-Men, it took almost, I can't remember like 10 to 13 years before anybody went, I remember that theme. I just figured it aired a season or two and died. That also happened after I left Saban and they handed me Dragon Ball Z and they said, the theme was done, I didn't do the theme, and they said, we don't care about this, just score it and deliver it on time. Three, four years ago, I found out it was this huge cult classic. I had no idea. I really like that show too. That was a lot of fun. And again, I got to do whatever I wanted. I just did this huge ethereal noise score for it. That's awesome. I had no idea. Yeah. It's another thing my name's not on, so you wouldn't. <laughs> we have some friends that connect you with that do live action recreations of Dragon Ball. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, enough to introduce you. <laughs> I didn't even hear the theme because I'd never seen the main title for it they were just sending me the uh the locked cut without that so um there was a lot of fun the score it really was there's a lot of that stuff it it was then but it it all worked out like 
on this show, Sweet Valley High. I had to beg my wife to come in and sing it for 75 bucks, buy out. She came in, she sang it, she's like, all right, the show does well. I get called one afternoon from a guy I still know. He goes, we're doing a commercial for Comcast and we'd like to have her come in. Do you know her? So I said, yeah, it's my wife, you can. So, um, and she had a 10 year run in commercials and always had at least five nationals running at any one time. And even when we signed to Universal, Hyundai um, used and reused our song that we'd written. SAG, she SAG, I made 20 cents. But we'd come home from tour and there would be stacks of envelopes with checks in them from SAG as the singer, because they kept and you'll know this, they kept reusing them, Class A network reusing on this spot and that spot. And if this one has a new word in it, it's a reuse. And I just went, you fucking owe me. You fucking owe me. I made you sing that theme. She didn't even offer to give me 75 bucks. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, well. Don't forget, honey, you know, it's the thing you hear all the time. What's yours is mine, and ours and what's mine is mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. She's, uh, it's not that. I was drilled for her. So you never know where stuff's going to lead. That's why you got to say yes to everything. And that's why so many of my friends that prefer to keep 100% of nothing still own 100% of nothing. You pay your dues. And that's what a lot of composers don't get, or anybody in any field. And the 20 some odd that have written me over the years, how do I get in? I'm like, find a composer at production house, knock on the door and say this line. I make great coffee, I'm your bitch. Because they're busy. And that's all they got time to hear. If you make great coffee and you're the bitch, and you're a great writer, five years later you might be doing something. I'm like, I think I'll get an agent. I'm like. I'm 3,500 episodes of television in and I don't have an agent. It's who you know and it's working hard and being good. That's what it is. Not that it's bad to have representation, it's just in the composing world, there's like two or three guys and uh, uh, you know. <laughs> so encouraging to hear you say that because like in the last year I think, um, I ended up cutting like replacement vocals for two projects I can't talk about like things are recording mm -hmm. but they paid us out like 100 bucks like to just shut up about it yeah you know mm -hmm. but it's funny though the NDA says like you know, guaranteeing that you won't speak about this project and I was like this is a guarantee for me that you won't credit me for this because it's such a horrific project yeah <laughs> but it was those so NDAs nobody minds yeah like that's okay fine yeah. it was such a widespread are you sure everybody has a copy, right? <laughs> I mailed it to you three times. There were so, such big projects, but I don't want to be attached to that at all. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's best not to. And I've had that in situations on shows where, say, the showrunner's significant other decided to write some songs which were so clearly plagiarized. And so I'd go, you know what? I'm going to give you all the writers. I'm not taking anything, you know, because the company's taking all the publishing, but I would just say, it's all yours. That way, if uh, there's ever a lawsuit, I go like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, avoid, yeah, <laughs> you don't want that kind of trouble. I've had friends that have been on both sides of that. I don't, that's not good. I think we're probably about out of time, but thank you so much for oh, being sure. here. And yeah, answering all these questions, all these burning questions. Um, but yeah, I mean, you already plugged your stuff uh, in the previous one, and, and um, yeah, is there anything else? You wanna... I guess it was like a similar, is similar to the last one. Mm -hmm. Like, how it, how did it feel to like have written something that's still like yeah, it's still impacting good. people, you know, mm -hmm. generations later? Even with the new Power Rangers movie, kids who have never seen the original ones saw mm -hmm. this film, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's. Uh, there's no higher honor. How nice to have that. At the same time, it can be uh, a bit of a problem because now everybody knows how long I've been, you know, in the television business. And that's uh, uh, what I find really interesting now. And this is 
something I've just come to realize. A lot of the people my age doing stuff now look at me and go like, you've been doing this too long. You're, we got to get somebody young. But this new crop of 30 and 40 year olds, I'm only in my 50s, but these, that, this new crop that's coming in and starting to do bigger stuff, they're different. They're not looking at that. They're looking for what can give them the best um, music for their project as opposed to, oh, I've got to go find a 20 year old because certainly you don't understand anything about what anybody's listening to. I'm like, you tempt your thing with Coldplay. I understand that you don't under, you're going to tell me that you understand what's going on. You use clocks. It's 2018. That's not going to impress the network. What the network's going to do is they're going to go, my mom listened to that song when I was a kid. So I find it really interesting that the switch is going on. And so there's this whole new wave I'm going to be able to ride, which I love. And they're brighter. It's just weird. They communicate really well, at least so far, the ones I've dealt with. And it's been a fair amount of now, enough people to say that. So it's, a, it's an unusual time. As long as we're not at war with Russia in 48 hours, all will be well. <laughs> I, I get it. I'd get a notification. <laughs> I have it set. Alerts. Yeah, it's in the latest iOS. If we go to war with Russia, you get, a, you get an alert. It's a, yeah, one of the Amber Alerts. <laughs> oh, it's right below Amber Alerts. Yeah. Right, war with Russia alert. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for oh, doing thank it. You. Awesome. thank you. That was fun. Oh, I'm not going to fuck up here. <laughs>